The next item of business is a statement by Fergus Ewing on unconventional oil and gas. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statements and there should therefore not be any inter intervention or interruptions. Colin Fergus Ewing, Minister, 10 minutes. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has long been concerned about the approach of the UK Government to the licensing of unconventional oil and gas in Scotland. Following the Smith Commission process, and given the licensing powers are coming to Scotland, something that I campaign for and that I welcome, it makes no sense for the UK Government to exercise them in Scotland. The Scottish Government's policy has been cautious, considered and evidence-based. The UK's approach has sought to develop shale gas quickly at any cost. In particular, the Conservative plan to remove landowners' rights to object to fracking under their property is a disgrace. I formally objected to the UK Government plans, and I was pleased that the UK will not now remove householders' rights in Scotland. Given the precedent of not acting on a policy area about to be devolved, the UK Government should now do the same with onshore licensing and should not issue any further licenses. I wrote to Energy Secretary Ed Davey last Friday to make this point. This was also why SNP MPs backed the amendment in the Commons which called for a UK-wide moratorium on oil and gas, on onshore oil and gas. Presiding officer, this government takes the issue of unconventional oil and gas, including fracking, very seriously. There are a range of views on the issue and we have tried to listen to all of them as we have developed our policy. We have listened carefully to concerns raised by local communities and environmental campaigners, and we have strengthened planning policy in five key ways, including by the introduction of buffer zones for the first time. However, we need to do more. We recognize that local communities are likely to bear the brunt of any unconventional oil and gas developments, particularly in terms of increased traffic and related emissions and noise impacts. These are issues that must be more carefully considered and be the subject of further research. We are therefore working to further strengthen planning guidance and my colleague Alex Neil, as Minister responsible for planning, is taking this forward. We have ensured strong environmental regulation is in place via Scottish Environment Protection Agency and made clear that we wish to tighten this further. And working with my colleague, the Minister for the Environment, Dr. McLeod, work to take that forward will begin shortly. Last summer, when the Independent Expert Scientific Panel published the report, we said that we would look further at the public health aspects of unconventional oil and gas. I can therefore confirm today that we plan to commission a full public health impact assessment. We have listened to legitimate concerns about potential negative impacts. However, we must also acknowledge that some take a different view and see opportunities in unconventional oil and gas extraction. The oil and gas industry in particular has a potential interest in this area for a number of reasons, as do the chemical industry. INEOS have indicated that they can use shale gas as both a fuel and a petrochemical feedstock for Grangemouth and I'm sure that I do not need to, remember, to remind members of the economic importance of Grangemouth to the Scottish economy. And of course, while much of the debate on oil and gas taxation has been about revenues from our offshore oil fields, onshore extraction could lead to additional public revenues. There is also an international dimension to unconventionals, and we should have due regard to the experience and practice of other countries. If there are lessons to be learned, then we must understand what those are and implement them here. We will seek to do that as part of our evidence gathering activities. Presenting officer, I want to ensure that the voices of the communities likely to be most affected are heard and are heard in a more formal and structured way. I'm therefore announcing today that in addition to the technical work I've referred to on planning, environmental regulation, and upon assessing the impact of public health, Scottish ministers will also launch a full public consultation on unconventional oil 
and gas extraction. This will allow everyone with a view on this issue to feed it into government, a logical next step in the cautious and evidence-based approach we have demonstrated to date and an example of this government's commitment to community engagement. It also means that the longer-term decisions on unconventional oil and gas will be informed not just by technical assessments but also by a fuller understanding of public opinion. Presiding officer, I've set out this government's cautious evidence-based approach to date and the work we will do to build on and further inform that approach. The further work that I've announced today on planning, on environmental regulation, on health impact assessment and a full consultation process will take time to complete. We will update Parliament on the timescales for that work in due course. Given the importance of this work, it would be inappropriate to allow any planning consents in the meantime. I am therefore announcing today a moratorium on the granting of planning consents for all unconventional oil and gas wells, including fracking. This moratorium will continue until such time as the work I have referred to today has been completed. I will keep Parliament advised of the progress of that work. A direction will be sent to all Scottish planning authorities today to give effect to that policy. In order to ensure consistency in the regulatory regimes, the Environment Minister, Dr McLeod, will issue a similar direction to SEPA for relevant new controlled activity regulation licences. Presiding officer, this Scottish Government has taken a responsible, cautious and evidence-based approach to unconventional oil and gas extraction. And my statement today sends the strongest possible message that we will continue to do so. When we assume res responsibility for onshore licensing of unconventional oil and gas, rest assured that my colleague Mr Neil and I will deliver a planning system, uh, will deliver a robust, consistent and complementary licensing and planning system that will be developed through the evidence from our consultation and further research announced today. We should never close our minds to the potential opportunities of new technologies, but we must also ensure that community, environmental and health concerns are never simply brushed aside. This government will not allow that to happen, and I hope the actions I have announced today will be widely welcomed as proportionate and responsible. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes uh, for questions, after which we move to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak button now. And I call Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And nobody uh, who knows him will be surprised that Mr Ewing used the word cautious four times in his short statement today. I thank him for an advanced copy of his statement, but the most important words he used today were that we need to do more. And indeed, the Scottish Government needs to do much more if it is to meet public concern about this issue. Labour has pressed for early devolution of licensing powers following the Smith Agreement. Order! Order! The response of some of those behind the Minister is very revealing indeed uh, and shows how selective they are in the way in which they have followed this issue. We have pressed for that early devolution of licensing powers, but the key issue is how Ministers use the planning and environmental consenting powers they already have. So I want to ask the Minister today, in spite of his instinct for caution, uh, if he will add some more to what he has to, had to say about those issues this afternoon. Labour at Westminster added 13 specific conditions. 13 specific, members would be as well to listen to this uh, so that Just they can be question, a McDonald. little better informed uh, in dealing with the issues that are raised. Labour has added 13 specific conditions to the infrastructure bill which must be met before consent can be given to fracking, 10 of which are in devolved areas. Will the Scottish Government now endorse these 13 conditions so that the consent regime in Scotland will be at least as tough as that in the rest of the United Kingdom. 
Will the Minister today match Scottish Labour's commitment that Scotland will not be first to frack in the UK? That fracking will not happen here until lessons have been learned from elsewhere. And will the Scottish Government now agree that no fracking project can proceed without the support of a local community expressed in a local referendum? Minister. Well, Presiding Officer, it's the hope of the Scottish Government that we can build the, the widest consensus and coalition behind the measures that we have announced today. And the measures that we have announced today, I believe, are characterised, as Lewis MacDonald has recognised, on a cautious approach on which the evidence is the central foundation of the decisions that should be taken. I believe, as a lawyer and as an MSP, that that, profoundly, is the correct approach. Today we have announced that there is now a moratorium in Scotland on unconventional oil and gas extraction. That moratorium will prevent any grant of planning permission uh, until such time as we have completed the work which I have announced today. It is therefore not necessary to hold local referenda on these issues because no planning permission will be granted whilst the moratorium is in place. Uh, where, and let me say this gently to Mr MacDonald, who, who, uh, whose uh, colleagues in Westminster uh, on one hand say that they wish to stop fracking, but on the other hand, when they have an opportunity to vote to halt fracking, abstain or just don't turn up. That is a very funny way to show their approach. It may be, as the former Labour leader in Scotland said, presiding officer, that Scottish Labour is a branch office, but under new management it appears that nothing very much has changed. Uh, and if I could point out, so far as the local referenda is concerned, that the track record on the Labour Party in holding local referenda uh, is not auspicious, because when they held a referenda in Aberdeen on the Union Terrace proposals, the people said yes, but Labour said no. Mugdell Fraser. Uh, can I thank the Minister for the advance copy of his statement? But it looks like his need not to be outflanked by Labour on this issue means he has suffered a humiliating defeat in his war with Joan McAlpin. <laughs> it must be a source of regret that so much of this debate is characterised by political posturing rather than being evidence-led and science-based, and that the Scottish Government would rather play politics than take decisions in the best interests of the Scottish economy. Yesterday, Tom Crotty from Ineos said, if Scotland doesn't embrace shale gas, we could see a collapse in manufacturing. It was little more than a year ago that every major party in this parliament came together to help secure the future of the Ineos Grange plant with the thousands of jobs which rely upon it. Now the Scottish Government has taken a decision to cut off any domestic supply of shale gas to Grangemouth, which Ineos say would help secure jobs for the future. Instead, they will have to continue to import shale gas from the USA. So can the Minister tell us, is it really the Scottish Government's position that fracking is fine as long as it happens in Pennsylvania, but not in our backyard? Minister. It's our position that in Scotland we should look at the evidence pertaining to Scotland. That evidence does not exist. That was the conclusion of our independent panel uh, last year, who said there were considerable gaps as to our knowledge in relation to hydraulic fracturing in Scotland. Let me say, presiding officer, uh, and repeat, and I, uh, as I referred to in my original statement, that we engage closely with INEOS. Uh, we meet with them regularly. We want, in the consultation that I have announced today, to hear everyone's views, as I made absolutely clear. That would include the views of INEOS and, of course, the chemical sector, as it includes views of individuals and communities throughout the country. I do think that Murdo really overstates and exaggerates his case. Mr Crotty made it clear in the newspapers yesterday uh, that the supply of uh, gas which they require to continue their operation uh, is a pair of contract that has been secured for 13 years. We welcome that. Not only did we welcome that, but Mr Swinney and the former First Minister were fully involved in supporting and helping to facilitate those arrangements. But if I could turn to the approach that his colleagues in England are taking, I first characterise that approach as gung-ho. Their approach 
is to carry out fracking anytime, any place, anywhere. It seems to me, presiding officer, that one inevitable consequence, as we've seen where planning applications have been put down south in England, is inevitable conflict and confrontation, leading, I suspect, to challenges in the court. And therefore, and therefore, could I suggest that the Conservatives, in conclusion, presiding officer, revert to the approach which they advocated in their policy document of January 2013, which was to take an evidence-based approach on these matters. I have many members who wish to ask a question. Can I ask for the questions and the answers to be as brief as possible? And I might just get to the end of the list. Angus MacDonald, followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. The Minister will be aware of my significant constituency interest. Therefore, can you tell me how today's statement affects the live planning application for unconventional gas extraction in Earth? in my constituency. And in addition, um, can I warmly welcome the moratorium, including the commitment to conduct a full public health impact assessment and a full public consultation on UG extraction. Can the Minister give an assurance that evidence will be gathered from experiences in other parts of the globe, not just in the UK? Minister. Uh, yes, I recognise that Angus MacDonald has uh, consistently and long campaigned for his constituents on these matters, and I pay tribute to his industry and also the way he's pursued these issues, uh, and therefore his uh, representations uh, helped to form part of the process that persuaded us that we do need to consider the public health impacts, so I'm happy to confirm that today. So far as the impacts on existing, uh, 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 on existing planning applications, the moratorium uh, cannot apply it retroactively to those applications that have already been granted, but it will be obviously applicable uh, with immediate effect, and the Chief Planner of Scotland and my colleague, Mr Neil, uh, of course, are taking that forward. Liam MacArthur, followed by Christina McKelvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his advance sight of his statement? It's been fascinating, Presiding Officer, to watch Labour and the SNP try to outdo each other in sounding sceptical about fracking, which they both support. Uh, to be clear, is Mr Ewing saying that after all the consultations, assessments and impact studies have been completed, Will he, as Energy Minister, be ruling out signing any contract for fracking in Scotland? Minister. Well, the, the, the whole point of obtaining evidence, as I've announced today in a whole series of fronts on a variety of issues, which are of genuine concern, as I think Mr MacArthur would acknowledge, certainly some of his colleagues do, uh, is to consider the evidence once we have it, not to prejudge the evidence before we have obtained it or, or sought it. So plainly, the we will not prejudge the outcome of the process that we have uh, set out today. I do, however, hope, presiding officer, that the plea that I made to Ed Davey, his colleague, uh, 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 recently, that no further licenses should be issued in Scotland, following the principle that Amber Rudd set out by disapplying from Scotland the proposal which the Liberals and Conservatives put forward to confiscate rights of householders to object to activities under their households. Now that that precedent has been set, then surely uh, Liam MacArthur and the Scottish Liberals will say that no further licences should be granted by their colleagues who are in coalition government with the Conservatives. I very much hope they will speak out on that issue. Christina McKelvey, followed by Jackie Bailey. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Does the Minister agree with Friends of the Earth, Scotland Head of Campaigns, Mary Church, who said, and I quote, it was a surprise that Scottish Labour MPs mostly abstained in the vote on a UK-wide moratorium on fracking and a vote in Westminster on Monday, given the party's new commitment over the weekend? And does the Minister agree with me that this exposed very clearly Labour's posturing on fracking to be nothing more than a disgraceful, shameless sham. Minister, that didn't relate to the items in your statement. Jackie Bailey. Um, let me give the Minister another chance to provide clarity on the Government's position. And can I ask the Minister for a yes-no response um, to two elements of Labour's triple lock system? Firstly, does he agree that there will be no fracking in Scotland until we learn lessons from the rest of the United Kingdom? Because I didn't hear an answer to that when Lewis MacDonald asked the question. And secondly, by his own statement, the moratorium is not indefinite. So will he agree to local referenda when applications are submitted, or is he denying communities a voice on issues affecting their area? Minister. 
Uh, well, I have announced today that there will be and there is a moratorium on granting planning permission for the extraction of unconventional oil and gas. That means, and let me put this absolutely clearly, that no planning permissions will be granted for that activity. The Scottish Government position is therefore totally clear. A moratorium applies Order. and there will be no planning permissions granted. I'm not quite sure what part of that is unclear. But let me turn to Jackie Bailey's second part of her question about the, uh, the points that they have raised, including local referenda. Uh, local referenda, according to the initial advice that we have had, uh, would be complex, costly, difficult to ascertain the electorate by the nature of Order. fracking activity, where fracking applies uh, uh, beneath the ground in an extended fashion, and therefore it would be impossible to ascertain the electorate. Uh, and therefore, it is not a, a process which is sensible or indeed part of planning law at the moment. Uh, however, because we have announced today, presiding officer, a moratorium, then the questions that Jackie Bailey arise, uh, raises do not arise. In conclusion, presiding officer, it seems that uh, the Labour position is not so much a triple lock as a total joke. Graham Day, followed by Sarah Boyer. I thank you. Can I warmly welcome the statement, in particular its delivery of a moratorium? But can I ask the Minister to set out what steps the Government will take to ensure that the consultation process is as far reaching as possible so that the voices of the people of Scotland are heard on the issue of unconventional oil and gas extraction? Minister. We can all agree in this chamber that it is right that decisions about these matters are taken in Scotland. And we have the opportunity. We open 216 to take decisions armed not solely with some of the relevant levers such as planning and environmental regulation, but also licensing, which of course is the key lever, and that is why it is so important. And therefore, it is absolutely right, as Mr Day suggests, that we should have a wide consultation of the people of Scotland, because the people of Scotland who we represent are entitled to and should have the opportunity in participating in a debate about a proposal uh, of a technology which, although not new in any sense, will be newly applied in Scotland. So Mr Day is absolutely right. We intend to announce the uh, consultation in around about two months. It will lapse, last for 12 weeks, the standard period. And I very much look forward to engaging with all of the people of Scotland in this debate. Sarah Boyer, followed by Willie Coffey. Will the Minister confirm that he will consider the implications of fracking and coal bed methane in relation to climate change? In particular, will he address the issues of fugitive emissions and the research that is now out there, given that the Scottish Government has failed to meet its own climate targets in the first three years? Minister. Uh, yes, I can confirm that that, of course, is one of the relevant issues which uh, myself and Dr McLeod will consider carefully in the course of the uh, evidence gathering exercise that I have set out today. Willie Coffey, followed by Cleva Beanish. Thank you. Can the Minister clarify that the granting of further licences by the UK Government cannot circumvent Scotland's planning system where these applications will be determined? Minister. Well, that is the purpose of the moratorium, Presiding Officer. The moratorium is to use the powers that we have in order to ensure that uh, we can obtain the necessary evidence, have the consultation that I have set out. Uh, however, in response to Mr Coffey's question, I would point out, and it is a matter of fact, that planning decisions can be challenged through the courts. Uh, they are subject to challenge by judicial review in other ways. And the only means that Scotland can take full power and control and decision-making and represent the people of Scotland on this matter is by restoration to Scotland of all powers on these matters, including not just planning, but licensing as well. Claudia Beamish, followed by Rob Gibson. Uh, can the Minister explain where the Scottish Government moratorium leave, leaves communities such as Cannonby in my region, where permission for coal bed methane extraction has already been granted? And in this regard, will the Minister agree with me that however robust any future guidelines were to be if fracking was to go ahead, the skills capacity does not exist to assess applications or monitor developments? Minister. Uh, well, it's a perfectly valid question and one to which we've given considerable thought. Uh, and therefore, that is why, as I've indicated earlier, that Dr. MacLeod has uh, issued a direction today to SEPA, the Environment Protection Agency in Scotland, 
to issue a direction to SEPA that no car license will be issued in respect of any unconventional gas application uh, pending the moratorium. And that action has been taken with ministers, myself, Mr Neil and Dr McLeod working together. But of course, the answer is again, if we had full powers in Scotland over all of these matters, if we had power over the licensing, the ability to grant the right to carry out uh, mineral extraction in the first place, then we would be far better able to control these matters in Scotland instead of these matters being in the hands of a Conservative Liberal government in London. Rob Gibson, followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, President Officer. Can uh, the Minister uh, deal with the question of international evidence gathering that needs to be carried out on public health and on methane uh, emissions in a way which separates the worrying facts surrounding unconventional oil and gas extraction from the fictions which are out there about fossil fuel use being acceptable in this day and age? Minister. Well, well, of course, th this is a matter which, as I've already stated, presiding officer, will be the subject of consideration in our evidence-based approach. And uh, the member knows that, of course, we are in the transition to a low-carbon economy, and we have made great stri strides forward, uh, both in generating green electricity and also in reducing emissions. However, there is more work to do, uh, and therefore, in the course of the evidence gathering that I've described, we will consider these matters with extreme care. Alison Johnson, followed by Claire Baker. Um, thank you. The Scottish Green Party is pleased that the Scottish Government has finally agreed with our long-standing call for clear opposition to unconventional gas extraction, and the huge public support we've had for our principled stance has undoubtedly played an important part in today's announcement. But of course, a moratorium is only I really need a question, Mr. It's Johnson. only a delay or a suspension. Is the minister aware that if he keeps the door ajar, public opposition will continue to grow and Greens will continue to engage with those communities across Scotland who want an outright ban now? Minister. Well, I, I do hope, presiding officer, as I said at the very outset, that we can see a broad consensus emerge that the proposals that I have announced today on behalf of the Scottish Government are a sound, sensible, cautious approach, where we have a national debate which is characterised by examining the evidence and looking at it with extreme care. And precisely because we do not have, as the member knows, all of the relevant evidence relating to Scotland in a whole variety of ways, I believe that that debate should uh, be better informed by the process that I have set out today. Meantime, the moratorium will apply until the process of evidence gathering and consultation has been concluded. I think that's the right approach, and not to prejudge the outcome of that is also the correct approach. But of course, everyone in this chamber is perfectly entitled to continue to campaign and make their views known, and I'm perfectly sure that that's exactly what they will do. Clay Baker, followed by Lois Smith. Uh, the Minister is well aware of my concerns around the UCG proposals for Fife. Uh, will the Minister's announcement today on a moratorium apply to the UCG proposals for the first of force? Minister. The powers that we possess apply to onshore planning activities, as the Member will know. They do not apply to onshore, offshore activities, uh, such as that which I believe would be covered by UCG, and therefore we would urge the uh, potential developers in the meantime to engage closely with the local communities on these matters and also to acknowledge that the highest possible standards in respect of environmental regulation must be pursued. Of course, were we to be in possession of powers in relation to offshore licensing as well, then, as Claire Baker may wish me to do, we could have been in a position to make uh, further progress, but sadly, as yet, we are not. Finally, Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, in the interest of uh, complete clarity about the Scottish Government's position, is the Minister saying that any landowner uh, in Scotland uh, would be in a position uh, to in prevent fracking under his property? Minister. The applications are considered in accordance with the planning process. Today I have announced a moratorium applies in Scotland and applications will therefore not be granted pending the outcome, Dear Mr. Pending the outcome of the process that I have described. And we took the view, and I think it is widely shared in Scotland, that when on the 28th of July 
Matt Hancock announced that rights to object to activities underneath people's houses would be withdrawn without any consultation of the Scottish Government, far less the Scottish people. We thought that was entirely wrong. And I think most people in Scotland, presiding officer, agree with us. My apologies to Richard Simpson. I'm afraid I need to move on. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 12160 in the name of Kezia Dugdale.